Hi everybody, Geo here. It's time for another adventure with the wolves. This story is called Little Lost Wolf. Do you have the dragon book they made those movies about? You know, the one that had the ring? A man asked. He was mid-twenties, casually dressed in jeans and a t-shirt, had dark hair and dark eyes, and smelled of motorcycle exhaust. Several, I said, and closed the antique book I was drawing from. It had a design I liked, and I drew it into my sketchbook. Nice drawing, he said, leaning in to get a closer look. My sketchbook was a hardbound black book with blank pages. I carried it with me everywhere. I led the man over to the fantasy and science fiction section up on the second floor. Try one of these. Thanks, he said. He glanced at me. Not a casual glance, but a deliberate one. For a second, I thought he was about to ask me out. That would not be a good idea, because things did not end well with my last boyfriend. Fortunately, he didn't ask, and disappeared among the shelves. Heading downstairs at Really Good Books Bookstore, I took the stepladder over to another shelf, quickly scanned titles, and put the antique book, Theories and Legends About Moon Cycles as Told by the Primitive Tribes of the Ancient Scandinavian Vikings, back on the shelves. A dusty volume and written in 1881. I think I was the only person in the world who had read it cover to cover. It was only a few hundred dollars. Maybe my boss would trade me for it if I painted his portrait. It had been my mom's favorite book. As a child, I remembered sitting on mom's lap as she read me the legends of the great Fenrir, of the moon, of the berserkers. Most important, if one read between the lines, it told of wolves who walked on two legs and hid among the people. The moon cursed. It also told about how the phases of the moon affects our lives, especially my life. One of the moon cursed must have written it. I'm Landon. One time, my last name was Knox. It's currently Steele. I have dark hair, pale blue eyes, and what makes me different from everybody else? My ears have a slight point on them, just like my mother's side of the family. My hair is coarser than everybody else's, more like stiff fur, also inherited from my mother. I never smile. Smiling means letting your guard down. Smiling means sharing enough trust to let someone get close enough to kill you or your family. I hadn't dared trust anyone for ten years. I studied art at college, even had a couple of paintings accepted for the student show last semester. They wrote up a biography about me and posted it online. Landon Steele, the homeless kid who made it to college and recipient of the Brancusi Foundation Scholarship Aid Program. When I discovered the article, I walked into the gallery and took my paintings off the wall and demanded they remove my name from the show. They thought me crazy. Who wouldn't want to be famous, the curator said. But she removed my name and the article. It was too late, though. I suspect the damage was already done. I waited and watched. I should have left college. I should have left my apartment. I should have left my job. Because if the wrong people had seen that article... They would kill me. I stayed because I was tired of running and I wanted a normal life. I hoped that if I graduated college, I could be normal. I'm not normal. The ache inside my bones warned me that the moon would be full tonight. I pulled the crumpled and folded bus schedule from my pocket and checked the times for the tenth time today. Whether my boss liked it or not, I'm leaving in 90 minutes. I crammed the bus schedule into my pocket, hopped off the stepladder, and lightly landed on my bare feet without making a sound. 
I never wear shoes. Sounds get you killed, Dad had said. Landon, my boss yelled, wheeling a card out. I need you to shelve these books and straighten up the magazines. The adults mess them up worse than the kids. On it, I whispered. I took the card and tried not to wince as one of the wheels made a minor squeak. The sound irritated my ears. I glanced around to see if anyone else heard. The customers didn't seem to notice. I walked to the back room on silent feet, found a can of spray oil, and quickly sprayed oil on all four wheels. The cart didn't make a sound. The oil smelled of some kind of chemical that irritated my nose and made me want to sneeze. I resisted the urge and sniffed the air. Something raised the hair on the back of my neck. I didn't hear anything. I didn't smell anything. I trust my instincts. Something was wrong. The main door opened. The bell on the door clanged, warning that someone entered. Soft footfalls, measured, controlled, like someone hunting their prey. My jaw clenched. A soft growl vibrated in my throat. I remained behind the cart, oiling the other wheels, though they didn't need it. I sprayed a little too much oil and rubbed some on my hands on the sides of the cart. The smell would hide my own scent. A smell. Male. Slight sweat scent. A deodorant that smelled of musk and something else. Was this a hunter? It was a full moon tonight. The pink moon. Also called the egg moon. Sometimes referred to as the Pascal moon because Easter is based on it. The full moon is the best time for hunters to catch one of the moon cursed. One of the children of Fenrir. Commonly called a werewolf. Me. How long have they staked this place out? Why hadn't I noticed? I must have made a mistake. Damn. Mistakes will kill me. I won't take the chance that it's not a hunter. I hid behind the shelves and crept to a better vantage. As much as I wanted that buck, it had to stay here. I had to leave. Does a guy named Landon work here? Some guy asked my boss. Something cold flowed down my spine. Very few people knew me. He was definitely a hunter. I was in trouble. I chanced to look. A man, dark hair with a little gray, faced away from me. He wore a black trench coat, and was that a priest's collar around his neck? The trench coat didn't move like leather or fabric, but had a stiffness to it. Kevlar or something similar. Something odd swung underneath it. Something two feet long and skinny, like a shotgun. I closed my eyes and sniffed, focusing on him. He smelled a little of gunpowder, of sweat, and the odd smell I detected was a kind of urine. Pig urine supposedly hid one scent from the supernatural, from the moon cursed. There was something about a priest and a shotgun that seemed familiar. Is there a problem, my boss said. No, Landon dropped his ring on the bus the other day, and I'm trying to give it back to him, the hunter said. The hunters had found me. I quieted my breath, but could do nothing to still my heart. I made my way into the back and grabbed my pack. The book would have to wait. My last paycheck would have to wait. This man was ready for a firefight. The people I worked with would be caught in the middle and maybe killed. I had to get out of here for my sake and theirs. I'm having him shelf some books so he could be anywhere in the store, my boss said. Landon, a friend of yours is here. I had to wait for a noise to cover the opening of the rear door and then I could escape. Running and hiding was the only way to survive. Then Landon does work here, the hunter said. A deep voice that tried to sound kind and understanding. I heard the underlying timber in his tone that spoke of fear. Quiet guy. We call him the Book Ninja because he's silent and he keeps to himself, but he does his work. 
my boss said. Since you're a friend of his, maybe you can answer a question. If I can, the voice said. Why doesn't he ever smile? One of the other workers thinks he has a tooth problem and he doesn't want anyone to see, my boss said. Other workers. Thank you, boss, for accidentally saving my life. Hunters usually don't work alone. His partner was probably outside the back door waiting for somebody to come out. One person flushes the prey out of hiding. The other takes the shot. I'm not in wolf form, so a regular bullet could kill me. Options. They knew my name, where I worked. They probably knew where I lived. It wasn't a coincidence they were here on the full moon. These hunters knew what I was and would be prepared. If I went out the back, I'd jump into their trap. Landon, where are you? My boss yelled. He must be upstairs. Come on, let's go find him. Their steps made a soft shuffle on the stairs. Now's my chance. I moved as quiet as I could and as fast as I could and sniffed the air. I had this hunter's scent. It only took a few seconds and I was outside, sniffing the air. Where were the other hunters? They weren't near because I couldn't smell them. I needed to make myself as hard a target as I could. A bus pulled up. I got on, scanned my bus pass, and went back to stand by the middle exit. One other person got on the bus. A nun, mid-forties wearing the same kind of trench coat as the man in the bookstore. She clutched a rosary and a Bible and looked about the bus. Could this be the other hunter? I sniffed, focusing on her. Sweat, perfume, gunpowder, pig urine. Damn, that's two hunters. I was being watched and followed and hunted. Her eyes focused on me. How did she know what I looked like? The online article had my picture. I shivered and clenched the strap of my backpack tight. The bus went a block and I exited from the middle door and walked into the nearest shadows. Found him, Gustavo, the nun whispered. These hunters were too good. She must be using some type of microphone and earpiece. The nun got off the bus, too, and looked around. Could the hunters be playing tag team? One hunter would follow me a short distance, then another would follow me, then another. That way they could trick me into believing I had escaped and would put me off my guard. That strategy worked best with teams of three or... Twang. The slight rustle of wind. Something moved. A crossbow bolt sped towards me. I dodged to the right, but was too slow. Something sharp pierced my shirt and lodged in my ribs. A sharp, coppery scent filled the air. Blood. Mine. Nailed him, Sister Adrian. The man who had been in the bookstore said, A crossbow bolt? It stung like it was silver-tipped. I pulled it out, grunting, and dropped it. My blood made a small puddle. I held my side with one hand. The wound stung. Had they used Wolfsbane as well? Landon, don't make a scene, the nun said. Come with us quietly. So you can kill me? Like the others? Murderer? I growled. I ran. This close to the full moon, the wolf inside me gave me its powers. I sprinted, my hand holding my side. They had found me. I wasn't safe. A hunter in a priest's collar. Why did that seem familiar? No matter how fast I ran, I wouldn't tire. I played hopscotch with random buses, noting who got on and off with me. I exited the bus, ran down an alley, and leaped over a fence. Then I leaped up to a fire escape, climbed to the roof, circled around, and watched the alley. My trail would be impossible for a human to follow. A wolf could, but I hadn't met another wolf for years. The hunters had shot and killed the only other wolf I had met. My boyfriend. That had also been a man in a priest's collar, but he had smelled of whiskey and pig urine. 
I stilled my breath and became as quiet as I could, as motionless as I could. This time, the hunters were my prey. And the third hunter didn't disappoint. A new scent, sweat, whiskey, old blood, and gunpowder. Pig urine. This was the hunter that had killed my boyfriend, an older man, his hair mostly gray and speckled with black. He held his rosary before him, letting it swing free. The way his trench coat moved, I bet he had a gun inside. I focused on the rosary. It had a wolf's head hanging from it. Somehow, this hunter had tracked me from bus to bus and down the alley. No sign of the other hunters. Each time I got on the bus, I had scanned my bus pass. Could he be tracking me through that? Did he work with a hacker? His phone rang. Yes, Brother Lawrence, he said. Father Lito, we need to call off the hunt. It's too close to the full moon, a man said on the other end. This is the closest we've gotten in months, Father Lito said. I'm not giving up yet. Kill the moon, but hurry, Brother Lawrence said. I'll see this beast dead, Father Lito said, and put his phone away. This man was large and built like a wrestler. He moved with the grace of a tiger stalking an antelope. He played with a black ring on his middle finger, and his rosary swung. Father Lito's smile was the most horrifying thing I had ever seen. Landon, Landon Knox, you don't need to hide from me. I'm your friend. I have something of your father's, and he'd like you to have it, Lito softly said. Landon, you can trust me. Oh, my God. He knew my name, my real name. No one alive knew that, except the hunters who had... Oh, my God. Damn the curator, damn the exhibit, damn the article. That's how the hunters had found me. I remembered where I had seen the priest collar before and heard the name Leto. These hunters were the same ones that had killed my tribe and my parents. For a moment, I was a twelve-year-old kid again, trapped in the disaster of ten years ago. Confused, so scared that I almost whimpered, and so terrified that I couldn't move. They killed our friends. Get in the car. Protect our son from Lido. Mom had screamed, shoving me in the passenger side of our car. I love you, my dad had said, and kissed my mom. If I can, I'll meet you where we first met, my mom had said. I'll hold them off. Now run. The door splintered as a shoulder pushed through it. It hit again, and the lock flew from the door, bounced on the floor, and skittered under a pile of old tires. My dad jumped into the car, his hands starting the car and gripping the wheel. The man wore a priest collar and smelled of whiskey and pig urine. Now this is a prize, the last of the Knox clan. Sarah Knox, your mate Robert, and your whelp Landon, the man said. I'd almost feel bad about this, but I've seen what werewolves can do. The Knox family tree ends now. Father Leto, I won't let you kill my son. My gentle mother transformed into a gray wolf and attacked. It wasn't a full moon, but her fury was just like it was one. Mom, I screamed. Be quiet, Landon, and don't look, Dad said, and pushed my head down with his right hand and drove with his left. Several bullets shot through the car, missing me. I curled into a ball and screamed. Be strong, my father shouted. Another shot. It hit the metal of the door, then the soft flesh of my father. Dad grunted. I smelled blood. My dad's. Dad, I screamed. He held his side with his hand, blood oozing over the black ring on his middle finger. I placed my hand on his, helping to apply pressure. Dad drove away, fast, bleeding, crying. I would never see my tribe again. I looked back and saw Mom in wolf form lunge at Leto, her jaws wet with his blood. 
before we turned a corner. Then I heard her snarl and growl, and a man screamed. A gunshot. Nothing snarled and growled. I knew what that meant. I would never see my mother again. I sat in the front seat, pressing my shirt against Dad's wound. He was bloody. I was bloody. I was numb. My friends, my family, were dead. We drove for a day, listening to random news programs. Dad turned up one. This just in. A bizarre tragedy killed several people today. The residence was rented by the Knox family, and investigators believe they were having a party when there was a gas explosion. No one survived. At least ten bodies have been identified, but names will not be released until families are notified. Landon, listen to me, Dad said, turning the radio down. You can use any name you want, but you can never be a Knox. The people after us will find you if you use that name. We drove for a couple of hours to a city I had never been in, and Dad pulled up in front of an abandoned amusement park. He was pale, and his eyes held a horror that I had never seen before. I love you. Be strong. Remember, stay quiet. Sounds will kill you, he said. Quickly hugged me and kissed my forehead. That was the last I saw of my dad. I found an old radio and listened to any news program I could find. Three days later, I knew the truth. Breaking news. A mutilated body was found today, victim of a gunshot wound and buried in a shallow grave. Hands and head were missing, as well as any identification. His car was found in a nearby lake with a dozen bullet holes in it. Investigators have identified the car as belonging to Robert Knox. The odd thing about this, he supposedly died with his family in a gas explosion. Investigators have gone through the evidence again, and they now believe the family had gone into hiding for reasons unknown, and they and their friends were executed. Sarah and Robert Knox had a 12-year-old son, Landon, who was not found among the dead, and is missing. Evidence suggests that Robert Knox fled his attackers and possibly hid his son somewhere. Authorities are asking for help on this one, both to find Landon Knox, if he still lives, and to bring the perpetrators to justice. A soft footfall brought me back to the now. Landon, you don't have to hide, Father Leto said, his hands raised to show that, except for the odd rosary in his left hand, he was unarmed. But this man knew my name. No one alive knew that, except for the people hunting me. This was the murderer, Father Leto, and his hunters, the best at their jobs and the worst human beings alive. They killed my tribe, my family, and my boyfriend, and now I'm next on their list. When I didn't respond, Leto held his left hand with the black ring high into the air, the rosary swung wildly in my direction. Leto faced me. Shit. Did he know where I hid? How? I held my breath and didn't make a sound. Do you recognize the ring? Your father wanted you to have it. Come here. I want to give it to you, Landon. My friend, you don't have to be afraid of me. Father Leto smiled a gentle smile. As quiet as I could, I left the scene. I ran for the nearest road while Father Leto was in the alley following my trail. I flagged a car down, took it a couple of miles, hopped off, and another, and another. Let's see Father Leto and his murderers track me now. Finally, when I had no choice, I flagged down a trucker going in the right direction. Once I climbed in, the driver looked at me and said, I'm Christian. Landon, I said and then realized I should have given him a different name. What happened to you? Christian said. Cut myself shaving, I said, and sat back so I could see every car who passed us. Do you want me to take you to a hospital? Christian said. No, I said. Are you in trouble? I didn't answer. I wasn't safe. I would never be safe. 
Looking out first one window, then another, I scanned every car that passed. None of them carried a nun or a priest. Tonight was the full moon. If it wasn't for my curse, I'd stay on the truck as far as he went, but I had to lock myself up so I didn't kill anybody. There was one place I could do that, with no people, no questions, no hunters. The abandoned Merriweather Amusement Park, the place my dad had dropped me off a decade ago. The only place I could be safe. They would never find me there, and tomorrow morning I'd head out of town. Let me off here, I said. It was two blocks away from the amusement park. My skin crawled, and I looked out the window. It was sunset, the sun not very far from the horizon, no sign of the moon. As soon as the sun settled below the horizon, the full moon would rise. The truck stopped. Thanks, you were kind, I said. What kind of trouble are you in? Christian said. None you can help me with, I said, and got out. The truck drove away as the sun settled on the horizon. I only had minutes until the moon rose. The silver that all wolves fear. My wolf ached to be free. It wouldn't be long. I ran to the old amusement park, found the broken section of the chain link fence, slipped in, and sprinted. I didn't have much time. My bones ached, eager for the change. The damn silver would peek over the horizon any moment. Nobody was around, so I jumped on the roofs and ran. The old park once housed a small zoo, the wild side, and had various animal cages inside. The building had a hole in the roof. I jumped down, stripped, and tossed my clothes and backpack in a pile. Nobody could find me here. I'd be safe, at least for tonight. I climbed in the cage, slammed it shut, and the first rays of moonlight peeked through the cracks. Was this my last change? If Leto found me, I wouldn't wake up. Fenrir, smile on me. It was an old prayer my mom had taught me, but Fenrir was pure chaos. Sometimes, though, he helped wolves in trouble. I gritted my teeth as the transformation began. My bones cracked, my skin stretched, my hands shook. Throwing my head back, I howled, and the hated moon took control. The dim light of the dawn leaked through the cracks in the walls. I woke in the cage, tired, groggy. My whole body ached. My mouth tasted foul and metallic. One of the bars had fresh bite marks on it, but it still held. The throb in my head made me nauseous, and I almost threw up. It was so hard to think. My name was... Think. It's urgent, I remember, because... Think... I'm in danger. My name is... Landon Steele, or should I say Knox, a voice said. I wasn't alone. Leto had found me. I jumped up, the ache of the transformation forgotten. Somehow, I had to get out of here before they killed me. My clothes were outside the cage, neatly folded and stacked in a chair. My backpack rested against the chair, but it was open. Why hadn't Leto killed me when he had the chance? A man sat in another chair, his features hidden by shadow. The man leaned forward, a brand new paper bag in his hands. He smelled of motorcycle exhaust. Remember me? The man at the bookstore? He was a hunter? How many people are after me? The man munched on some beef jerky and he tossed me a piece. He held my sketchbook and flipped through the pages. I'm forgetting my manners, he said. Call me Compton. I didn't say anything, but I fiddled with the lock and let myself out. Some of your drawings are quite good, Landon. You've made a good life for yourself. College, an apartment, a good job. That's what makes this harder. I'm sorry about this, Compton said. And when he slapped my sketchbook closed... It revealed the switchblade in his hand. Thank you for joining me, everybody.
I appreciate it. The next part will be coming soon, as soon as I write it. Peace.